Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, probably one of my favorite maritime personalities from history is the famous legendary maritime architect, William Francis Gibbs. His career span and life accomplishments were huge, and his name is attached to some of history's most fondly remembered and famous ocean liners. He's best known for his work on the SS America in the United States, but before this, he had designed a whole suite of elegant liners, chief among which included a number of running mates for the US Matson lines. It was the first of these, Malolo, whose career almost ended before it began, and which almost sank the reputation of her designers and shipbuilders including Gibbs. Matson Line had predominantly been a freight service operating on the US West Coast from the 19th and into the early 20th century, but it had plans to supplement its income from freight with the growing tourist market. You see, by the 1920s, tourism, especially to the tropics, became more popular, and passenger ships began to operate cruises to destinations like Fiji, New Caledonia, and Hawaii. In the early 1920s, the company sought to modernize its fleet, and the contract for the design of the first of a group of proposed tropical ocean liners was won by the company Gibbs Brothers Inc. William Francis Gibbs had originally studied and practiced as an attorney, but a lifelong love of ships drew him to a career in naval architecture. Incredibly, he was self-taught, and along with his brother, Frederick Herbert Gibbs, overcame incredible odds to become an outstanding designer of ocean liners. Their first major coup was the complete overhaul and redesign of the German liner Vaterland, which had been seized by the US government from her original owners. Because of the forceful seizure, no plans were at hand, so the Gibbs brothers were contracted to create a full set of ship's plans from scratch, mapping out the vessel inch by inch, and then redesigning her after war service to operate as a passenger liner, the Leviathan. The project's successful completion meant that the Gibbs brothers were a big name in American naval design by the 1920s, but even so, the proposed Matson liner would be one of the first passenger liners that William Francis would design from the ground up. He did this with an unusual keen attention to detail, which bordered on the obsessive, but as it would happen, this would go on to save lives in the hundreds. The new ship would be named Malolo, after a type of Hawaiian flying fish, and Gibbs' design called for an elegant two-funneled liner about 580 feet long. 17,000 odd gross registered tons and with capacity for some 620 passengers. When construction began in 1925, she was the largest ship yet built in the United States. And of her design, William Francis stated that she will be the finest liner of her type ever built. It is our intention to incorporate every modern idea that will pass the stern scrutiny of practicability. The San Francisco to Hawaii route was a popular one, especially with the rich and famous. So Malolo was not designed with a third class, as on other ocean liners of the time. She would carry 457 in lavish first class and just 163 in cabin class. A lot less luxurious than first, but still generously appointed. Besides, the main draw for many cabin class passengers was the tropical destination, Hawaii. The ship was an absolute stunner, with elegant lines and a beautiful profile. She boasted modern interiors, a hairdressers and a barber, lounges, and a very high-tech gym. There was a well-stocked library, and in the ship's hull, a spectacular two-story tall swimming pool on par with the more famous transatlantic liners of the day. This was the height of the prohibition though, so being American-owned, it was a dry ship and alcohol couldn't be bought or sold on board. Instead, she was fitted with soda fountains for passengers to enjoy. The ship would be a floating resort that would carry curious tourists to an exciting tropical holiday destination. But all of this luxury and beauty concealed a secret double purpose. Built with potential US naval service in mind, Malolo was fitted with mounts for six inch guns and could easily be converted into a troop ship or even an aircraft carrier if required. She was completed in 1927, but it was not an easy job. The previous year, one of the riveting team catch boys, who was tasked with handling the red-hot iron rivets used in the construction, had dropped one, and it set the scaffolding on fire beneath his feet. The fire had spread, gutting some of the completed interiors and ruining others with smoke damage. Gibbs held the shipyard to blame, and they had to spend the modern equivalent of $2 million just to repair the damage. That wasn't the only issue, though. Gibbs' obsessive eye for detail resulted in $4 million dollars of unanticipated costs thanks to what he deemed as substandard materials or defects, but which probably would have flown under the radar for any other construction project at the time. It drove the ship's builders, William Cramp and Sons, into bankruptcy just as the Malolo was completed. Despite all this, she was delivered and finally ready for sea trials in May 1927. 
The sea trials would see Malolo put through her paces. The engines worked up to full speed for the first time and her turning circle and stopping distance tested to regulations. For this event, Gibbs, his brother, and their business partner, US Admiral David Taylor, were on board to observe. She would clearly be a hit and was exactly the kind of ship that Matson Line needed, but first she just had to pass her sea trials. She was anchored off Nantucket and departed on May 26, 1927 for a series of planned runs to test her propulsion and handling. Conditions began to deteriorate though and a dense fog set in. The trials would have to be postponed, another small frustrating inconvenience to add to the ship's already bumpy construction. The sea lanes off Nantucket are extremely busy and to plow at full speed would have been a huge risk, so the ship steamed slowly back, engulfed in a foggy blanket. Gibbs and his brother had stayed on the bridge to observe, and they must have been a little disappointed. But suddenly, there was a commotion, because out of the fog, on Malolo's port side, there appeared a large, black mass. It was a ship's bow, and it was barreling right towards them. Now, if this story is beginning to sound familiar to you, then it's probably not without reason. Eleven years prior, the Empress of Ireland had been lost in similar circumstances, rammed directly amidships by the Norwegian Collier Storstart, and then 29 years into the future, 1956, and in the exact same stretch of water, the Italian liner Andrea Doria would sink after a famous impact with the Stockholm. Now, with the Empress of Ireland's disaster fresh in their minds, the Gibbs brothers could only watch in horror as a freighter, the Norwegian ship Jacob Christensen, cut through the water and drove her bow deep into the Malolo's side with a terrifying crash. Many on the Malolo were knocked off their feet and there was the sound of tearing hull plating as the freighter's bow drove home like a giant axe blade. The Atlantic Ocean began pouring uncontrollably in. Malolo was a twin screw ship with two propellers driven by powerful steam turbines to a top speed of 22 knots, making her one of, if not the, fastest liners on the Pacific, 1927. The turbines got their steam from boilers in two boiler rooms beneath the first funnel. And it's here that the Jacob Christensen's bow had plunged in, creating a hole two feet wide and 15 feet tall, exactly at the bulkheads separating both of the boiler rooms. Gibbs, up on the bridge, listened with horror as the two ships collided, Malolo's hull plating tearing and her rivets popping. Admiral Taylor recalled, They say she was a small boat, but let me tell you she looked like 20,000 tons. She came up with a bone in her teeth, meaning that the ship was travelling at great speed enough to show a, a wave at the bow and she looked as big as a snowbank. Down in the hull, one poor switchboard operator was at his post when a wave of seawater burst through a bulkhead and swept him up. He luckily managed to escape drowning. Gibbs himself walked up to the control switch for the watertight doors in the bridge and threw the alarm. Bells began ringing inside the ship, but there was a problem. With the boiler rooms flooding rapidly, water had doused the furnaces and steam supply had began to die out. The turbo generators needed that steam to create electricity and slowly the ship's lights began to flicker out until it was mostly plunged into darkness. Fortunately, the emergency generators came on and dim emergency lamps lit the hallways and the bridge. Admiral Taylor thought the Malolo was doomed and he said that he had never before seen a ship be rammed square amidships and still remain afloat. He said this with good reason because, of course, this exact kind of blow had killed the Empress of Ireland and would go on to sink the Andrea Doria. Opening the boiler rooms up to the ocean like that is usually a death sentence for a ship, with power quickly fading and a confused crew Watertight doors on the Empress of Ireland had remained open and the ship had sunk in only 14 minutes because water was free to flow through the entire ship. But Malolo was different. The Gibbs brothers' obsession with safety at sea had seen them install automatic watertight doors on all of Malolo's 12 watertight compartments, and with electricity enough to operate them, they should close. The two brothers ran down from the bridge and descended a staircase until they were walking in water. They spotted a watertight door which was still wide open, but this was actually by design as the Gibbs brothers had put in a time delay on the doors to allow crew and passengers time to escape. They waited what seemed like an eternity before finally the door's motor sprung to life and it shut tight. All through the ship, the watertight doors closed and the water couldn't flood its decks. You see, unlike earlier ships like the Titanic, Malolo's watertight compartments rose up as high as the ship's superstructure with watertight doors in every opening. The water just had no way to flow back into the ship and the bulkheads separating the flooded boiler room and the unflooded engine room held firm against thousands of tons of water. There was, though, one final moment of drama. The two-deck tall swimming pool was flooding because a drain cover had burst open at the bottom of the pool and was letting water in uncontrollably. 
Somebody had to get in to close it tight, because if the huge space flooded, it could tip Malolo's delicate balance over and sink the ship for good. One of the William Cramp shipyard workers stripped down and dived into the pool, managing to close the drain cover after a few long dives. Malolo stopped sinking and incredibly, the ship was safe. She wasn't able to move, devoid of her boilers, but her watertight compartments had held. The ship had taken on between six and 7,000 tons of seawater, and the ship was sitting a hole six feet deeper in the water. Any other ship would have and probably should have sunk, but Malolo stayed afloat with less than a five degree list to port. For the Gibbs team, it was an absolute triumph. Their ship had comfortably survived what normally would be an unsurvivable situation. The ship didn't even need to be evacuated and nobody was put away in the lifeboats. Instead, the Malolo's captain sent a distress call and requested a tow. Two nearby tankers rushed to the scene at speed because the rules of the sea dictated that a rescue crew would be awarded a handsome salvage fee. Arriving on scene at the same time, it became a race to see who could put their crew aboard Malolo first. Both tankers launched a boat, each filled with their strongest rowing crew, and took off. The New York Times reporting that both crews pulled with as much vim as a Harvard crew across the choppy waves, but despite this, the towing effort failed when the cable snapped. So three powerful ocean-going tugs came out to meet Malolo and towed her back into New York Harbor. The only injury resulting from the collision had been a crew member's sprained ankle. Her hull deep in the water, Malolo anchored off Staten Island, and even the director of her bankrupted builders had to admit that, I doubt the hole in the Lusitania was as large as this one we have. We are here in New York Harbor. That speaks for itself. Malolo was towed for repair work while the shipping world was abuzz with discussion about the ship's survival. Throughout the entire process, Gibbs had kept disasters like Titanic and the Empress of Ireland in mind, and this motivated him to raise the ship's watertight bulkheads as high as they could possibly go. If any other design team had designed the Malolo, the ship's bulkheads would have merely complied with the regulations of the day, and she would have sunk after the collision. For Gibbs, his extreme eye for detail and obsession over safety measures was vindicated. He said that collision gave us a status no one could argue with. You have to regard yourself as a trustee of the public when you build a ship. Malolo was repaired and finally completed her maiden voyage in November 1927. She became an absolute favorite on the San Francisco to Hawaii route and spent many, many happy days at sea. Family photo albums show parties and fun days spent relaxing on the ocean. In the Second World War, Malolo's naval pedigree was put to use and the ship served as a troop ship. Surviving the war, the liner was put back to work on her old route, eventually sold to home and then Chandra's Lines, renamed Queen Frederica, and put to work as a cruise ship into the 60s and 70s. It was in the late 1970s, after a 50-year-long career, that the old Malolo was at last sent to the shipbreakers and broken up for scrap. It was a valiant effort for a ship which almost sank without having ever carried a single passenger. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.